Well, good afternoon, congregation, and welcome to God's house. We pray that we may have a blessed worship service and that his name, the name of our Lord Jesus, may be uplifted and that he may be praised and glorified. There are no announcements, so our call to worship comes from Ephesians 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Let us respond by singing Psalter 10, stanzas 1 and 3. 10, 1 and 3. The Lord has again called us and brought us together to worship Him. We confess that our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth, who keeps truth, lives forever, and never forsakes the works of His own hands. Amen. Congregation, receive the greeting of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, in the communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us continue to worship God today with singing from Psalter number 241, 241, stanza 1, 2, 3, 5, and 7, the first three, and then 5 and 7 of 241. <laughs>
Let us again turn in God's Word this afternoon to the Old Testament and read from 2 Samuel chapter 8, 2 Samuel chapter 8, and then also from the book of Psalms, the 60th Psalm. So 2 Samuel 8, and then Psalm number 60. So, so first of all, 2 Samuel 8, verse 1. After this, it came to pass that David attacked the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Methag Amma from the hand of the Philistines. Then he defeated Moab. Forcing them down to the ground, he measured them off with a line. With two lines, he measured off those to be put to death, and with one full line, those to be kept alive. So the Moabites became David's servants and brought tribute. David also defeated Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah, as he went to recover his territory at the river Euphrates. David took from him 1,000 chariots, 700 horsemen, and 20,000 foot soldiers. Also, David hamstrung all the chariot horses, except that he spared enough of them for 100 chariots. When the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David killed 22,000 of the Syrians. Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became David's servants and brought tribute. So the Lord preserved David wherever he went. And David took the shields of gold that had belonged to the servants of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. Also from Beta and from Berothai, cities of Hadadezer, King David took a large amount of bronze. When Toi, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated all the army of Hadadezer, then Toi sent Joram, his son, to King David to greet him and bless him because he had fought against Hadadezer and defeated him, for Hadadezer had been at war with Toi. And Joram brought with him articles of silver, articles of gold, and articles of bronze. King David also dedicated these to the Lord, along with the silver and gold that he had dedicated from all the nations which he had subdued, from Syria, from Moab, from the people of Ammon, from the Philistines, from Amalek, and from the spoil of Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah. And David made himself a name when he returned from killing 18,000 Syrians in the Valley of Salt. He also put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom he put garrisons, and all the Edomites became David's servants. And the Lord preserved David wherever he went. So David reigned over all Israel. David administered judgment and justice to all his people. Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was over the army. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was recorder. Zadok, the son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, were the priests. Sariah was the scribe. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites. And David's sons were chief ministers. So far from 2 Samuel 8. And then turning to Psalm 60, and the reason we are reading Psalm 60 is that it seems to be a psalm that fits also this time in David's life. Some of the details that we read in the title are a little bit different, and yet there seems to be enough sim similarities that suggest this was from the same time. So Psalm 60, the title is, To the Chief Musician, Set to Lily of the Testimony, a Mictam of David for Teaching, when he fought against Mesopotamia and Syria of Zobah. And Joab returned and killed 12,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. O God, you have cast us off. You have broken us down. You have been displeased. O restore us again. You have made the earth tremble. You have broken it. Heal its breaches, for it is shaking. You have shown your people hard things. You have made us drink the wine of confusion. You have given a banner to those who fear you, that it may be displayed because of the truth, Selah, that your beloved may be delivered. Save with your right hand and hear me. God has spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and measure out the valley of Succoth. Gilead is mine and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the helmet of my head. Joab is my, or Judah is my lawgiver. Moab is my washpot. Over Edom I will cast my shoe. Philistia, shout in triumph because of me. Who will bring me to the strong city? 
Who will lead me to Edom? Is it not you, O God, who cast us off? And you, O God, who did not go out with our armies? Give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. Through God we will do valiantly, for it is he who shall tread down our enemies. So far the reading of God's word, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. We want to come before the Lord in prayer, and in our prayer we will remember Albert and Anne Vandenbrink. Albert was taken to hospital after the service this morning where he is being subjected to some various tests to find out exactly what is going on. We will commend Albert and Anne to the Lord. Let us pray. We come to you, O faithful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To whom else can we go? You have the words of eternal life, and you alone can be our wisdom and our guide and the refuge of our souls. We come to you, Lord God, this afternoon and pray that you will hear us, that you will hear our cry, and that you will help us in our time of need. We praise you for the promises that you have given us in your word. And how every promise is yes and amen through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We praise you for the promise that you will always be with your people, that you will never forsake your people, that we can trust you at all times to assist us in whatever our needs might be. And we pray, Lord, that we may live close to this promise and that we may plead this promise again and again, that you may do as you have said. We thank you too, Lord God, for your promise for the promise of Jesus Christ, especially that he will come again, that he will return on the clouds of heaven someday to make all things new. And Lord Jesus, we praise you this afternoon as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. We praise you as the bright and morning star. We thank you for the way you have taught us in your word that we are to trust you and obey you and so also someday to eat from the tree of life. And we thank you too for the warning that you give us that, we live, that if we live in sin, if we live in disobedience, if we live in rebellion, then we will be outside the city and we will remain there in outer darkness where there is only wailing and gnashing of teeth. Lord, we need this warning also to remind us of the seriousness of, of the gospel call, of the urgency of the gospel call. And we pray, Lord, that we may hear when you summon us to come to you and to live. And we pray that we may live close to you all the days of our life. Help us hold fast to you, O Lord Jesus Christ, and will you hold fast to us. And we pray that in the meantime, as we wait for your coming, that we may be busy and faithful in all that you give us to do, whether it be in family life, or in our work or studies, or in the community at large. We pray too, Lord, for grace and help in the church, in our responsibilities one to another as brothers and sisters. We also pray for the office bearers. That you will strengthen them and bless them, equip them for their work and give them all they need for their task. We pray too, Lord, for your blessing on the voting that is scheduled for Thursday evening to be done in a different way electronically. We pray that the process and the method may go well, be objective. We pray, Lord, that you may grant to us men who may be called by you to be able to serve in the office, in the office of elder. We pray, too, for all of the others who have already been elected and affirmed and answered that call and are waiting for installation, we pray that you will equip them and prepare them for their task. Lord God, we commend to you every one of the congregation in all their needs. And we again pray for those who are under doctor's care. We think of those who are dealing with cancer and who are awaiting test results, maybe undergoing treatments. We pray for Hannah and Dan as they wait for another scan. We give them quiet trust and 
perfect peace as they wait. And Lord God, will you make all things well for Hannah? We pray the same for Anita Brower, that you may be gracious to her. You know her needs, and will you supply for her also in body and soul? We pray this afternoon for Albert Vandenbrink. And we think of how this morning at the end of the service he became so unwell. We pray for him, Lord, even now in the hospital. We pray that he may be stable. We pray that he may grow stronger. We pray that he may, through the doctor's care, receive insight and understanding into what happened and receive appropriate treatment. Will you lay your hand of healing upon Albert? Remember him in all of his weakness. And Anne also, as she has experienced weakness recently and lives with a heart condition, Lord, remember her and remember them together and their whole family, Monica too, and be near to them, Lord, and surround them with your loving kindness and your grace. We pray again for all of our elderly members, and we thank you for them, Lord, but we think of them also when they become less able to attend worship and be so involved in church life as maybe they were in previous times. We pray for them, Lord, that you may remember them and be faithful to them. We have sung of your great faithfulness. We have sung also of the sure mercies of David. And those who put their trust in you, you have guaranteed, will never be put to shame. And we pray also that our elderly members may experience that and that you may bless them from day to day. Remember also the ministry of Pastor Vanermeinen as he cares for them in a particular manner. And will you strengthen him and bless him in his service to them. Be with him too also in the coming month as he will serve the congregation here. And together with Pastor Scholz, will you bless the words they bring and will you prosper the gospel seed as they sow it in dependence upon you. We pray, Lord, also for Shalom. So you've been asked by way of the bulletin announcement to remember Shalom in prayer. We thank you again for that institution and we pray that you will bless it richly. Bless all those who live there and are cared for in that place. And be near to the caregivers. Strengthen the staff and encourage them and give them, Lord, all they need from day to day. Wisdom and patience and endurance and kindness and Christian grace. We pray too, Lord, for your blessing on the efforts to add another shalom to the region or in Hamilton. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless those plans and also, all of the securing of permits and paperwork as is presently ongoing. Prosper, Lord, those efforts and grant too that the government may continually be favorably disposed to this work and see the value of it and see the support for it and appreciate it. We pray that you will bless all that is going on to, to erect a new building and also relationship with the neighbors and the community at large. We pray, Lord, that in these things, the world around us may see our good works and be led to glorify the Father who is in heaven. Be led to see also how it is good and right to care for our old people and how we value life and do not disparage it or seek to end it prematurely, but cherish it as a gift from you. Lord, we think of how confused our land is and our society and this world how increasingly it shows its, its, its wickedness and its rebellion, especially in our culture, how we see many signs of being given over by you as a judgment for our ongoing sin. And Lord, we grieve that and we lament that before you. And we pray for a mighty work of your Spirit. We pray that you will bless the Word wherever it is preached and grant that it may find entrance into many people's hearts and lives and bring light and result in... In, in new life, people brought from darkness into light, people raised up from death unto life. We pray that you will bless the work of Wilf Bout and strengthen him in his ministry to the migrant community. Encourage him week by week and bless the word that he brings. And remember the people he serves in all their needs. We thank you for their service, also for our economy. And we pray for them and their families far away and for your safekeeping hand, for your sanctifying grace. We pray too for the work of Teen Challenge as there is an offering today for that ministry. We thank you for all that is done through Teen Challenge, for all the people that are cared for and served, for all the captives that are set free 
by way of this ministry. We thank you, Lord, for what Teen Challenge may do by your grace. And we pray that you will bless it richly and all those who go through the program. We think of how drugs and alcohol cripple so many people and destroy so many lives and families. How to be trapped by the devil also in substance abuse of whatever kind. To fall into slavery to addictive behavior is so detrimental and even eternally destructive for so many. We pray, Lord, that you would have mercy on many and also in our day that you would work so that the power of the drug lords is broken and the, the allure of, of the drugs and alcohol abuse is broken. We pray that we may see also in our day many people brought to experience how satisfying you are in Jesus Christ. And when we delight in you, then there is no need to live in the ways of sin or to pursue the foolishness of the world. Protect especially our young people when they can be so curious, when the devil can be so slippery. Oh, Lord, guard their minds and their hearts and help us as parents to know how to speak truth and to speak wisely, gently, firmly, and faithfully to them in a way that we may lead them in the way that they should go. Oh, how we love our youth, oh Lord God. How we love our children. How we long to see them fearing God, walking in your ways. We pray for your mighty work of grace in their lives. And as you have brought us together this afternoon once more to worship and to hear your word, will you speak, oh Lord, and may we be like Samuel, servants who listen to what you have to say. We pray all these things in the pardon of every sin through the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Amen. Again, we commend to you the needs of the church and the work of Teen Challenge. And may the Lord bless you when you have the opportunity to give to His praise and for His glory. So we read from Psalm 60, and let's at this time sing from Psalm 60. Not often one that we sing, but turn with me to 158, and we'll sing stanza 1, 3, and then 6, 7, and 8. So 158, and we'll sing 1 and 3, and then 6, 7, and 8. Defeat and Triumphant Hope is the title.
Our text is from 2 Samuel 8, the whole chapter, and we'll be referring also at a point to Psalm 60. And beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we know, Canada is a nation that is part of the commonwealth. And so that means, among other things, that we have a queen, Queen Elizabeth II. Now, someday, very likely, our queen will be succeeded by a king, unless the monarchy falls away altogether. Some people talk about that. Some people maybe want that. But barring that, someday the queen will be succeeded by her son, or maybe her grandson, or maybe even her great-grandson. And when that happens, there will be, among other things, a coronation, a crowning of the king. And when that takes place, the people will shout and the choir will sing, God save the king. I thought of that when I studied this text for today. Because twice in this chapter we read this line. To Samuel 8, we read that the Lord preserved David wherever he went. End of verse 6, end of verse 14. The Lord preserved David. And literally, you know, the word is saved. The Lord saved David wherever he went. And so what we might someday say when Charles is king or William or George, what many might someday say, God save the king, here in our text, that is exactly what happens. God saves the king. And God saves him every day. And God saves him all his life. And that is the key to understanding David and the success of David, and the blessing of David. God saves him. Now this chapter, 2 Samuel 8, is a summary-type chapter. Here, as we are in the midst of this study of 2 Samuel, this chapter provides somewhat of an overview of the reign of David. What was his reign like? What was he like? What did he do? What did he accomplish? This chapter lays out a summary. Now, it doesn't tell us everything. It doesn't tell us really the low points, but an overall, an overview, as it were. And what it highlights, again, is that God saves the king. What it seeks to make clear, by repeating also this phrase in 6 and 14, what it makes clear is that, that, that God preserves David, and, and God enables David, and God strengthens David. And that makes all the difference. God saves the king. So the focus of this chapter and the focus of this sermon will be exactly that. And let's keep in mind that David leads us to Jesus Christ. Let's keep in mind that David is a type of, of his greater son. That's how we have to read this history. That's how we have to study this history. So that what God does for David and through David... Today, God has done for Jesus and is doing through Jesus. Through the history, God was carrying out His saving work, ultimately in and through Jesus Christ. Someday we might have an earthly king, Charles or William or whoever. We might have an earthly king. But already now, and all our life, we have indeed a heavenly king, and that's Jesus. And this chapter is meant to point us to Him, and this chapter is meant to even to teach us about Him. And He's what we need. For He alone can be our salvation and our life. So it's always good to hear about Him. Let's get into it then. God saves the King. That's our theme. And first of all, let's notice how He does so gloriously. God saves the King gloriously. And that's clear in several ways here in this chapter in 2 Samuel 8. Uh, for example, notice how David beats back every enemy. Every single enemy goes down. Much of the chapter, in fact, is really unfolding that for us. So it starts in verse 1, for example, with David beating the Philistines and attacking them and subduing them. And then in verse 2, we're told about how David conquers the Moabites and he kills a number of them. And he compels the rest of them to pay tribute and tax money. And so if in your mind you are thinking of a map of, of the land, you, you can imagine David going west, conquering the Philistines, and then going east, overcoming Moab, 
And then he goes north. Hadadezer, king of Zobah, was in the north. And David defeats him. Hadadezer with his many chariots and his horsemen. Hadadezer, who was a flaming idolater. His very name meant Baal helps. But David defeated him and destroyed him. And when Assyrians come to help Hadadezer, David settles with them too, and he kills 22,000 of them, we're told. And he's able, in verse 6, to put garrisons in Syria. So we can imagine him putting forts in different places and stationing troops in those forts. And so the Syrians become subject to David and have to pay taxes and tribute money to David. And so the north falls to David. And then finally also the south. Verse 14, we read about David fighting the Syrians again, but now near the Dead Sea in the Valley of Salt, which was near the Dead Sea somewhere. And David fights the Syrians and the Edomites. And apparently again he is victorious for he is able to set up garrisons in Edom. And throughout all Edom he puts forts and troops. And so the Edomites too become David's servants. And now the south belongs to David too. North, east, south, west, David conquers all. And the key is the Lord. Through the Lord, David became valiant. Through the Lord, David was preserved, was kept safe, was victorious. Through the Lord, the Lord preserved David wherever he went. How important this is. Also, when we think about the very real question of all the bloodshed, because there is a lot of bloodshed, and how do we understand that? And, and maybe even more, how do we justify that? One thing we can say at this point is that we don't necessarily justify all of it. For instance, when David measures off prisoners of war, presumably with the, the Moabites, he, he measures these fellows off with two lines, we're told, in verse 2, and he kills them. That, that seems, admittedly, a little harsh. David maybe shouldn't have done it like that. We really don't know one way or the other, or enough, at least, to say with any conviction. But we can be sure that David, like every one of us, was not a perfect man and not a perfect king. The best of men are men at best. And so also for David, as much as there is so much good to say about him, David cannot be our Savior. And so we should not be totally surprised or altogether put out when there may be seeming inconsistencies or even extreme behavior. In fact, this whole chapter, as much as it really sets forth a glowing picture of David, at the same time it raises just a few little red flags, like this matter of his treatment of the men of Moab. What's all that about? And like with his sparing enough horses for a hundred chariots. What was that all about? They didn't need chariots. They didn't need horses. The Lord had been clear about that. Why did David save a hundred chariots? And, and at the end of the chapter, when we're told about David's sons being made chief ministers, literally the word is priests. Again, what was that for? What exactly was that all about? They weren't meant to be priests. The king's sons weren't to occupy any position of the priesthood. Little red flags come up as we study this chapter that make us remember David cannot be our savior, must not be the perfect king. And so it's okay when we read things in the text that leave us a bit unsettled, make us ask some questions, and we don't have to justify David at every point. But having said that, another thing to keep in mind is that all these people were not simply enemies of David. No, let's remember that. They were enemies also of the Lord. For David was the king that the Lord had set up. And Canaan was the land that the Lord had given to his people. And so for anyone to oppose the people or the king or to flex their muscles in the land and say, this is our land, was in essence to challenge God himself. And that could not be left alone. And so David had to go to war. And David had to defeat enemies. And David had to put men to death. For it was for the Lord and for the glory of the Lord 
And so the Lord preserved David. And so the Lord saved David. By the way, there is one king who is spared. At least one. One king and one people. A man by the name of Toy, as he is called in verse 9. Toy, king of Hamath. Hamath was further to the north. And when the king of Hamath, when Toy heard that David defeated Hadadezer, Toy was very happy about that because he didn't like Hadadezer either. And so what he did was he sent a diplomat to David, his own son. And he sent him with a gift. Vessels of silver, vessels of gold, vessels of bronze. You know, in a way, Toy and his kingdom are an illustration of what we read in Psalm 2. Because he kissed God's anointed. And he lived. Unlike all the others who came raging against David and were destroyed, Toy didn't do that. Toy sent his son to bless David. Toy sent his son to give David gifts. Toy bowed to David. He submitted to David. Isn't that what all people must do with the son of David? Doesn't the Bible warn us? If we do not kiss God's anointed, we too will die. And, and the Bible doesn't just say that. The Bible sets that forward in very gripping language. Someday the king, the king will come to destroy all his enemies. Listen to the way Paul puts it in 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7 and 9, or 7 through 9. How he talks about the Lord Jesus coming with his mighty angels. Quoting Paul now. In flaming fire. To take vengeance on those who do not know God. And on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul says these shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Now that is not a politically correct thing to say. But it's the truth. And we ought never to forget it. Not for ourselves. Not for our families. Our friends. Our neighbors. And that there be no one, no one here living in sin and thinking that's okay. You can get away with it. You will not. But at the same time remember that today is a day of salvation. And just to hear this is to be shown grace. How important it is that we hear the voice of the Lord. Today. And turn today. But back to the main point, David is conquering and it's because of the Lord. The Lord preserved him, the Lord enabled him, the Lord saved him. And what glory then marked David as he drove out every enemy and defeated every one. And so he reigned in victory. But the Lord saving David with glory is not only clear in his victories, but also in his accumulating all sorts of wealth. So several times in the text we read about tribute money, shields of gold, and large amounts of bronze, and articles of gold, silver, and bronze. And the fact is the Lord was at work to enrich David tremendously. He grew very wealthy, and the gold and silver just came piling in. And of course at that point David faced a tremendous temptation, like everyone does when they become rich, when they get wealthy. What will I do? with all that I own? How will I manage all of this wealth? By the way, you don't have to be among the 1% to struggle with that question. Even a little bit of money can be a problem. And David here, of course, he gets a lot. He gets loaded down with abundance. But what does he do? Verse 11 is clear. He dedicated his riches to the Lord. That means that he took what was coming in and he, he, he purposely set it aside for the building of the temple, for the house of God, that his son would someday erect. David dedicated his treasures to that, to the Lord. And here too, we have to see, we have to see the Lord's preserving hand. Because on the one hand, David was, was mighty and David was famous. We read in verse 13 that he made a name for himself. That simply means that his reputation spread around and people knew David was someone great and David was someone strong and you didn't mess with David. It was better to bow to David. He made a name for himself. He gained riches for himself. He was mighty. But in this moment, David didn't fall. David didn't do what so many have done and that is to lay up treasures solely on earth. 
David didn't do that. He didn't live simply now for himself in this moment to indulge all of his selfish, sinful desires. No, he practiced laying up treasures in heaven. All the riches he received, he learned to offer up to God. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't enjoy our money. The Bible never says that we have to give everything away to the Lord and never spend a single cent on ourselves. The Bible doesn't teach that. But it is fair always to ask the question, where is our heart? What matters to us most of all? And what are my investments? What does the way I handle the resources God has given to me say about where my treasure really is? At some point or another, our life will always make it clear. In David's case, he learned here. He was taught here. He was enabled, really, to dedicate his riches to the Lord. And this was part of the Lord's preserving him gloriously, saving him as king. And then one other thing to see in terms of the glory of God saving the king, not just the victories David had won and the wealth he was given and shared, but also the way David ruled. So we read in verse 15 that David reigned over all Israel. And David administered judgment and justice to all his people. And that simply means he was a really good king. He was fair. He was right. He did well for his people. He treated them respectfully. And he shepherded them with integrity. That's how we should all use the authority that we're given. Whether it be in the family or in the workplace or in the church. We are to rule justly. And in the fear of God. And David did that. And what a blessing that he was to his people. And, and how those people must have thrived and prospered under his hand. With him as their king. And it was due again to the Lord preserving David. The Lord saving. The Lord blessing David. The Lord was doing it for David. The Lord was making David great. Gloriously so. It's also important to recognize that David was not alone. He was the king, yes, but he had a whole team to help him. And they get mentioned, or some of them at least, at the end of the chapter. Joab and Zadok and others. They were all part of it. It reminds us of a principle taught throughout the Bible that the Lord makes use of many individuals. A whole community of people to serve in His kingdom and for His glory. But altogether now the point is that God was saving the king gloriously in terms of his military victories, in his increasing wealth, and in the way he ruled the land. What a king he was turning out to be. And all of it was due to the grace of God, as is always the case. We are what we are by the grace of God. Everyone. It's nothing less than that. So it was for David, even as he shines at this moment. But even as we think about God saving the king, let's notice not only that he does so gloriously, but secondly, faithfully. Faithfully. Our second point. Because let's remember that chapter 8 now comes after chapter 7. And if you remember chapter 7, what was that all about? It was about God coming to David and covenanting with David. We looked at that a couple of weeks ago. How the Lord appeared to David through Nathan gave David a word through Nathan, and that word was about all the blessings that the Lord was about to load into the life of David, and blessings that would culminate ultimately in the great son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a part of those blessings, one of the things that the Lord promised was safety for Israel and success for David. So let me just quote to you one verse from chapter 7, verse 10. The Lord saying, through Nathan to David, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. So a place for Israel, a safe place, and likewise success for David, making his name great. Again, you can trace that out in chapter 7, making your name great, David, establishing your throne and your kingdom. Here is this whole list of promises, all in chapter 7. Now we get to chapter 8. And chapter 8 is, is simply the text saying, see, it all came to pass. 
It all happened as God said. God said, David, I will save you. I will make you successful. And then the text says, look, he did exactly what he said he'd do. He was true to his word. And isn't that crucial for us to see? Because all of human history, on a grand scale and also individually, all of human history and ultimately the whole kingdom of God, you know it's governed and guided by the word of the Lord. And the Lord doesn't lie. And what the Lord says will come to pass. Every single word will be fulfilled. We're to see that congregation. We're to pick up on that as it's, as it's revealed throughout the Bible. And we're to be encouraged by it. Challenged by it, yes, but also and especially encouraged. God is faithful. Now, here in 2 Samuel 8, we don't read about David recognizing that as such. We don't read that David reflected on all that he was experiencing and receiving and, and saying, oh my, God is being faithful to his word. I can tell. We, we don't read that. But think now about Psalm 60. That's why we read Psalm 60, because it gives a window of insight into what may have been some of the challenges along the way and how David learned to respond to those challenges. Just to refresh your memory, in Psalm 60, verse 2, David writes about how the Lord had made the earth tremble and had broken it and had shown the people hard things. And so there may have been difficulties along the path. We read about all these victories, northeast, southwest, but maybe it wasn't always so easy. The text doesn't tell us back in 2 Samuel 8, but Psalm 60 suggests along the way it must have been, there, there must have been moments where David didn't know, where, where maybe even they got pushed back. And that's what it's like, isn't it, in the service of God? It's not so that because well, we're Christian, or we follow God, or we live in obedience to His Word. Everything gets easy. No, we know differently. We experience regularly that it's not so. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. The way is often hard. There are many setbacks. We can have times of discouragement, seemingly unendingly so. Even now, some of you are in the midst of hard things. You have been fighting illness. You have been going through personal crises. You have been dealing with great family trouble. And more besides. And it is not easy. And it wasn't for David. But listen to what David says in Psalm 60, verse 6. God has spoken. And so what we have there is David remembering the word of the Lord. He's seeing all this around him and he's saying, but God has spoken in his holiness. And then comes a variety of, of prophecies in the psalm, climaxing ultimately in the overthrow of several of David's enemies, Moab, Edom, Philistia. And the point is, here we learn that what was encouraging David and helping him to press on in faith was God's word. And the fact that David knew that God would be true to his word because he is a faithful God. And if God said he would establish Israel and establish David, if God said he would preserve the king, then, well, if God said it, he will do it. And so David got up the courage to go forward and to fight. Who will lead me into the strong city, he says. Through God we shall do valiantly. For it is he who shall tread down our enemies. Because he is the faithful God. Because he has spoken. And because he will not abandon his word. And that's not just true back in 2 Samuel 8 and Psalm 60. It's true today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God remains the faithful God. And he saves the king. And he saves his people. And he does so because his word is true. Is that not something to hold on to? Also, whenever we face challenges, whenever there are threats and dangers and fears, sometimes everything in this world can seem so totally out of control. Sometimes maybe in our homes or in our families, things can seem to be so totally out of control. 
Sometimes we can think, how in the world can I go on? How can we make it? How can we ever survive this? Maybe in Christian service or, or maybe even more basically in Christian faith. Like David, we face tests and temptations. We fight spiritual battles, what Christian doesn't. Or maybe with David, we're blessed with wealth, but we struggle in how to handle it. It keeps taking over our heart and we don't dare let any of it go for God. Or maybe we're overwhelmed by the responsibilities entrusted to us in our family or at our workplace or in the church. Maybe like David, God has called you to rule in a particular sphere and you want to, but you don't know how to or you fear you will fail. Really, the scenarios are endless, aren't they? How is God reading your heart this afternoon? What's coming forward as you sit here and listen? And how will you face it? Only as you look to the faithful God. God has spoken. God has spoken. And so we go by His Word. And we rely on His Word. God saves the king then faithfully because he is a faithful God. Great is his faithfulness. But we cannot leave this chapter without making one more point. So God saves the king gloriously and faithfully, but then lastly, God saves the king ultimately. And here, hopefully, everything will come together. Ultimately. What does that mean? Well, it means that God didn't just save David in this time and in this text. God didn't just save David in terms of his rule and reign. No, but God in this moment was at work to save David from everything. From sin, from death, from hell, from judgment. God was at work to save David forever. Ultimate salvation. That's in view here, even in 2 Samuel 8. Because let's remember that God had raised up David for what? So that someday he might bring the son of David, who will save from everything. Yes, and God saving David here helps us to know that he's all about that plan. He's doing this because he's really about that. He's saving David here so that he can save David ultimately and so many more besides. Is that not what God will do when he sends finally King Jesus? And if we think of David and Jesus, David and Jesus, in so many ways, David foreshadows Jesus. In other words, it's like David is the shadow of Jesus falling upon human history. Sometimes someone is walking and you see their shadow before you see them. That's a bit like how you're to think of this David as the shadow of Jesus. First we get Jesus' shadow in Jesus, in David. We get Jesus' shadow in David. And then finally, Jesus himself arrives, as we know. But already the shadow is, is telling us about him helping us to anticipate Him and to identify Him. And here, just think of a few things. Think of how, like David overcame his enemies, so the Lord Jesus overcomes His enemies, even worse enemies, the very worst. Think of how Jesus Himself forecasted this when He said in John 12, just before He was about to be arrested and crucified, you know, He said, Now shall the ruler of this world be cast out. It was a declaration of war. And Jesus would accomplish it in a way that no one understood at the time. He would accomplish it through his suffering and his death. But accomplish it he would. Now is the ruler of this world cast out. And so he strode forward to the cross where he disarmed principalities and powers through bearing the judgment for sin and taking also the, the, the sting of sin, taking death captive through his own death and resurrection. Today we know he's busy putting every enemy under his feet. His dominion is from sea to sea, the Bible says, and all around the world. And there is a day coming when the kingdoms of this world will be the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. Every enemy, north, east, south, west, every enemy will bow. And think, too, how much he has been given and how much he has given. How much he was given, how much he has given. Jesus Christ. Already as a child, when he was 
there and the, the wise men came and they presented him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It was a token of the treasures that come pouring into his coffers when he is king of kings and lord of lords. Well, most of his earthly life, he lived in relative poverty, that's true. But even so, that didn't stop him from giving and giving and giving. What a giver he turned out to be, giving even his own body, even his own blood for sinners like us. And through his sacrifice, now he is able to give pardon and peace and power through his spirit, even to all who ask him. Ask, and you shall receive. For he gives. And then think of, like David, how Jesus reigns and rules over all his people and over all the world. And he does so with perfect judgment and justice. We might have some questions about David, but we never need to have questions about Jesus. He's always fair, he's always right, and he's always good. And even in hard times when we don't always know His mind, and that can often be, we don't always know His mind, we can still be absolutely sure of His heart. So in all these ways, David foreshadows Jesus, and Jesus fulfills David. And just as God saved David, even more, He saved His Son. For Jesus didn't remain in the grave. On the third day, He rose again. Now He's been exalted to God's right hand. And just as David got a name for himself, even more, far more, Jesus has a name above every name. And every knee ought to bow, and someday every knee will. And through him, that's through Jesus, what happens to David? He enters into ultimate salvation. He's saved forever. And you know, not only David, but everyone else who turns to Jesus and trusts in him. Every sinner who looks to Christ is saved. In fact, it's really neat the way it works. Because when you trust in Jesus, you know you're saved. Yes, wherever you go, wherever you go, you know you're saved. Nothing can snatch you from His hand. Nothing can separate you from His love. But think how this parallels also the experience of David. For God saves His people in a similar way. What do we confess about Christians in Lord's Day 12? Christians as followers of Christ become prophets priests, and kings. And if God saved the king in our text, he saves all his kings today too, all his people. And he saves them gloriously. Like David, enabling his people to beat back our enemies. Think of indwelling sin. Think of the roaring devil. Think of the ever-pressing world. And think of how the Bible says we become more than conquerors through Him who loved us. And likewise, the Lord enables us to serve Him with energy and with our gifts. We we learn to offer our bodies a living sacrifice. We learn to say, all that I am and have and do, I, I, I give to you, Lord. And He teaches us to live justly and righteously. He teaches us to love His commandments and to order our lives according to His Word. And so like He saved David gloriously, He does it now also for all His people. And He saves us faithfully too. For He's true to His Word and He keeps every promise. Everything He has said to us in the Gospel and pledged to us in our baptism, He keeps it all. And finally, He saves us ultimately. For He saves us from sin. And He saves us in life. And He saves us through death. And He saves us forever. See, God saves the King, David, Jesus, and all who belong to Him. Do you see the line, congregation? Do you see the line? It's so important to see the line. Once you see the line, everything begins to make sense. And let there be, therefore, no one who stays apart from this God, this great God in Jesus Christ. But let us all Let us all be those who seek Him and serve Him. Amen. Let us pray. Lord our God, many years ago you saved King David. And you saved him wherever he went. You saved him gloriously and faithfully and ultimately 
We see that most of all in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of David, the King of Kings. And Him too you saved, even as He went in obedience to the cross, to suffering and to death. He was successful, and you raised Him from the dead, and you seated Him at your right hand. And now you call everyone everywhere to kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and we perish in the way. And you promise to everyone, blessed are those who trust in Him. And Lord Jesus Christ, may we all be those who trust in You. And will You so keep us and save us wherever we go, gloriously, faithfully, ultimately. Yes, through our whole life, may we be your people. May we bring glory, honor, and praise to you. And will you someday take us to yourself. Help us to see the line that's in the Scriptures. Help us to see, Lord God, what you are doing. Help us to see in a way that we marvel and in a way that we give ourselves over to you. For there is no life worth living apart from living it in dependence on you and for you. So bless your own word through the power of your Holy Spirit. And be with us now, Lord, as we come to the close of this service. Strengthen us for all that's ahead in this week and also in this month. Keep us in your care and reunite us at the appointed time. And we pray these things in your name alone. Amen. Our closing song will be 397, stanza 1 and 8. 397, 1 and 8, and our doxology will be 196. But at this time, I invite you to rise to confess our faith. Please stand. And let us repeat the words of the Apostles' Creed together in answer to the question, what do we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Receive now the blessing of the Lord and go to your homes and into this week in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.